Hello everyone, my name is Isabella Mox and I am pleased to present to you today about women in conflict and peace building. The study of war and peace in international relations has largely neglected the role of women. Women's roles are often sidelined, portrayed as helpless victims of war without agency, and their needs and contributions are ignored in the peace building process. However, Numerous studies have shown that women's active inclusion in conflict and peacebuilding is vital for social and political gains, both for women and for that of society as a whole. When analysing the role of women in conflict, we can look at women's role in militarised society, the socio-economic impacts of conflict on women, women's role in the military, the exploitation of women as a means of warfare, and the impact of conflict on refugee women. Cynthia Enloe is a feminist writer and professor who asked, where are the women? In reference to international peace and conflict studies. Feminist theory studies gender inequalities through gender politics and power relations, promoting women's rights and interests. Gender, according to Simone de Beauvoir, is the imposition of the social constructs of femininity or masculinity upon a person by society. Feminine stereotypes, including being more emotional, dependent upon others and weak whereas masculine stereotypes are portrayed as logical, detached, and strong. Enlo argues that women and children are often grouped as one as victims of conflict in the very one-dimensional representation. Women are pushed to the margins of power systems, but are not actually helpless as depicted. From the margins, women strategize with the resources available to them and take action involving women's grassroots organizations to promote peace and are vital to the peace-building process. In militarized society, women are symbolized as the upholders of social and cultural values and have been used as motivation for men to fight. World War II policymakers struggled to balance the need for women's labor support with retaining their image of vulnerable femininity to motivate men to fight. An example of this recently is Kim Gorski, whose husband was employed in the 2003 Iraq War. The Pentagon expected Kim to sustain her own family and raise morale among other military wives and prevent them from passing their grievances to their husbands so that they could focus on their war-waging missions, stating that wives should not be distractions. By September 2003, Kim was 11,000 US dollars in debt, and this was not addressed by the Washington wartime budget. She said she felt she was fighting her own war on the home front. Wars have socio-economic consequences for women that without gender analysis are overlooked. Wartime governments commit high proportions of their GDPs to military expenditure, resulting in reduced investment in social provisions such as housing and healthcare. This has a large impact on women, as they are primary carers often in families. Due to pre-existing gender dynamics, women are also first to be laid off, as male employment is prioritised post-war, leaving women more economically vulnerable. In the military, women are often excluded from combatant roles, justified through gender biases and reinforced by masculinized military language, which creates an atmosphere of male dominance. Women have fought in wars throughout history, but their efforts are usually undocumented and erased from history. Women are slowly becoming more accepted into the military throughout the world. For nearly a decade now, the Syrian Kurdish resistant fighters has included many women, including an all-woman unit. Combat roles in the British Army opened to women in 2016, as previously they were banned on the basis that women would affect male soldiers' combat cohesion. Women are almost always minorities on military bases, and they have to charter the required mode of masculinity needed to fit in. And they too frequently experience sexual harassment and assault in the military. Cynthia Enloe argues that military men assault women as intruders into their previously securely masculinized military environment. Jessica Lynch was an American soldier who was captured by Iraqi soldiers in 2003. Eleven of her fellow soldiers were killed and six were injured alongside Lynch. Lynch's rescue was extensively covered by the media, with the narrative painting her as a female victim in need of protection. Lynch was described by the media as tiny and petite. She was also painted as a hero, describing how she fought back, but her heroism was coloured by the sexist notions of a woman's bravery. Despite her courage, ultimately, she was still depicted in need of rescue by male soldiers, the real heroes. 
Gender is a weapon due to the strategic advantage of perceived femininity. The US Army deploys female engagement teams in Afghanistan to gather intelligence on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They liaise with local civilian communities and visit women in a domestic setting to distribute food and supplies, befriend them and become their source of confidence to gather this intel. Women are also used as a means of warfare, with armies using the rape of women to emasculate their opponents. Kiang Wakang, the UN relief official, pointed to how when militants from the Islamic State in Iraq and Levant captured territories in Iraq and Syria, they punished women to demonstrate their power. This involved the repeated rape of girls, forced marriage, and selling girls into slavery. In the 1971 Liberation War, 300,000 Bangladeshi women were raped by members of the Pakistan army as a strategic attempt to target the Bengali ethnic identity. Forced migration as a result of conflict often leaves women vulnerable to care for children alone, sometimes in refugee camps when they are vulnerable and exposed to exploitation. This results in an increased workload for women, retaining domestic responsibilities, as well as having to turn to non-traditional income sources to support their families in the absence of men. In refugee camps, unaccompanied women are vulnerable to both material hardship and violence, exploitation and trafficking. Refugee camps, therefore, represent serious threats to women's security, health and freedom. Unaccompanied women are sometimes forced to enter protection marriages to avoid sexual assault, and within families, frustration with the poor conditions of camps leads to escalated violence and abuse. The abuse of refugee women also occurs not only at the hands of male camp residents, but also by National Migration Administration and humanitarian staff. Women play an important role in peacebuilding and security, yet their contributions are often overlooked or ignored. Women's role in peacebuilding can be analysed in terms of their involvement in the peacebuilding process, their post-conflict rights and post-conflict security. The masculinised militaristic approach to peacebuilding is a hindrance to women's involvement in the peacebuilding process. Between the years of 1992 and 2018, Women only made up 13% of negotiators in peacebuilding, 3% of mediators, and 4% of signatories. It is therefore vital for women to be included more, not only to secure their rights, but to enhance the likelihood of peace agreements succeeding. According to a study by the International Peace Institute, looking at 182 signed peace agreements between the years of 1989 and 2011, when women are included in the peace process, there is a 35% increase in the probability that a peace agreement will last at least 15 years. As Susan Sebet, a lawyer and advocate from South Sudan said, women's inclusion in peace building will create sustainable peace. The aftermath of conflict provides an opportunity for women to be involved in the creation of new national policies and institutions to be better represented in post-conflict society. Women's active leadership roles in military society and peace activism can give them leverage to claim a stake in post-conflict society and politics. It is very important for women to be involved directly in the peace-building process in order to change gender power relations and make social and political gains in the aftermath of conflict. The exclusion of women from the peace-building process only reinforces their confinement to traditional roles of caretakers, making them invisible from political issues. However, post-conflict women's rights often suffer, as their exclusion from the peace-building process simply reinforces their confinement to the private sphere, and they are often scapegoated for socio-economic problems post-war, blamed with political or cultural betrayal in their efforts for greater representation and rights. In Somalia in the 1990s, inter-clan conflicts led to civil war and state collapse. Prior to the civil war, women had held positions in the army and as judges and ambassadors in Sayed Bar's former government. Having had these positions of power and being less invested in inter-clan feuds, this led women to form associations across clans to work together on societal issues and conflict mediation. These women's efforts opened inter-clan dialogue and helped to disarm fighters and open discussions of Somalia's future, eventually leading to the creation of the 2012 National Constitution. 
During the conflict, hundreds of women's movements emerged and they were involved in peace efforts. The rise of gender-based NGOs in the aftermath of the war enhanced women's social roles and their role as peacemakers was recognized and valued by their communities, extending their rights in post-conflict society. In the Nepalese civil war from 1996 to 2006, Nepalese women took leadership roles in their communities through grassroots peacebuilding efforts, risking their lives to negotiate between government security forces and Maoist rebels to bring peace. Post-war, women activists lobbied to be included in peace talks and the creation of the new constitution. They had rallied pressure against both sides to resume the peace talks between 1996 and 2006, and had continued this until the comprehensive peace agreement was reached in 2006. Women's organizations had held national conferences strategizing their inclusion in the peace building process, but they were not included in official peace talks in 2005, nor in the comprehensive peace agreement talks, both of which they facilitated. Women did make several social gains after the war, including the Gender Equality Act of 2006, and eventually, through the support of international organizations, women's movements and lobbying, they made significant gains in the 2015 constitution, including marital rights and rights to political participation. However, the issue of wartime sexual violence was excluded from the post-war political agenda, denying many Nepalese women peace and security in the aftermath of war. Therefore, despite heavy involvement in the war, women were still denied participation in security forces and opportunities for political advancement. The norm of the militaristic approach to peacekeeping often excludes women from the peacekeeping process and reconstruction efforts. For peacebuilding to succeed, security needs to be ensured. But by excluding women from the peacebuilding process, women's gendered needs are left unaddressed, leaving society unstable. In male-dominated peacekeeping operations, security involves the cessation of hostilities between warring factions and disarmament of main rebel groups mainly by men. There is little appreciation of the differential impact of conflict on women, including the long-term consequences of sexual violence. Women's security is defined as the absence of military, sexual and economic violence, and the traditional security definition of disarmament ignores these needs. Women's needs have been overlooked in the United Nations disarmament, demobilization and reintegration strategies, as they are not seen as immediate threats to traditional security. Ignoring women's specific security concerns by focusing on peace and security through a hyper-masculine framework hinders the development of sustainable peace. This environment, with the view of women as victims rather than as stakeholders in the conflict, along with a masculine definition of security, prevents women's issues from being seriously considered at the negotiation table and in the reconstruction of post-conflict society, leaving women's issues unaddressed, failing to ensure peace. In 2013, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 2122, which recognizes the importance of addressing women's security and peacebuilding. This resolution stresses the need for efforts to address obstacles in women's justice in post-conflict settings through gender responsive legal, judicial and security sector reforms. It also recognizes the need to increase women's participation in and the consideration of gender related issues in discussions that are pertinent to the prevention and resolution of armed conflict, peacekeeping and security, and therefore requests consultation with women's organizations and female leaders, including socially or economically excluded groups of women. However, in practice, this is still an often neglected area that needs further development of implementation. Indubitably, women play a significant role in both conflict and peacebuilding that should not be ignored. Women's involvement in the peacebuilding process has proven vital for both the success and sustainability of peace, as well as for addressing women's specific issues and ensuring their security. With the increased usage of drones in surgical warfare, there are less and less physiological arguments for the exclusion of women from the military. Contemporary warfare opens opportunities for eliminating gendered stereotypes in conflict and as a result, improving opportunities for peacebuilding, hopefully looking to a more sustainable, peaceful future for all. Thank you.